Hi there, this is Matt of State of Flex here with a review for the complete original series of Star Trek. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about Wandering Witch Publishing. One of my friends started a publishing company, an alternative publishing company. This is a space for growth where imaginative thinkers come together to challenge perspectives by engaging with counterculture through magical realism and real magicalism. If you're interested in writing and getting your stuff published for poetry, short stories, novels, this is an alternative publishing company for you to pursue. Or if you like reading, if you're a consumer of literature, this is a great means for you. However, this upstart company needs help getting up and started. So in the description section below, I have included both the GoFundMe page and the website link where you can read more about Wandering Rich, Wandering Witch Publishing and see if this is something for you. Uh, please check that out. But moving on to Star Trek, the original series. About one year ago, I had committed to reviewing the complete series of Star Trek, individually, season by season, and I don't think I'm going to do that just because of how time-consuming that is. That said, I did want to talk about each series and each film on its own, and there are some series as we move further along that become a little more comprehensive, a little more structured in individual storytelling where I might just review a complete season. If you're interested in my thoughts on the complete first season of the original Star Trek, I urge you to go back and take a look at my video that I did publish for that about one year ago. I'll also include that in the description section below uh, through a link. But uh, I got reinvigorated by watching Star Trek Picard Season 3 to go back and start from the beginning with Star Trek. So I am committing to doing that uh, review for all the Star Trek medias. Um, I'm not going to do it necessarily in release order or anything. I'm sort of following the track of the Enterprise and then I'll branch out and uh, do the spin-off series and things like that. But what I wanted to say is I love Star Trek. The original series is my favorite series of the bunch. Um, a lot of that has to do with character. I love the characters in the original series but particularly the, the dynamic of the main three, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. What I love about them is that Kirk, Spock, and McCoy create an interesting balance in that you have your main character, your heroic Captain Kirk, who is often put into a corner with some kind of moral dilemma. And who does he have standing on each shoulder? but a devil and an angel. The brilliance of Star Trek is they inverted the traditional idea of a devil and an angel. You have Spock, who very much is reminiscent of a devil with the pointy ears and the very dissociative way of speaking. And he is governed by pure logic. And he acts as the angel on the shoulder. You'd think he'd be the devil based on how he looks. Originally he was even supposed to be red painted, but no, he is the voice of logic. The even balance that Kirk must hit to think things through to the logical conclusion. But you can't always use logic. Sometimes you need passion, and who do you have is the doctor. The traditionally angelic figure in our society are people who work in healthcare as the one who governs the passion of Kirk on his other shoulder. And when the three of these characters are together, this show is masterful. And what the show does is rather than do seasons that are nowadays we would have like long form season where you'd have one story that you're kind of uh, doing. This was back in the 60s, and in the 60s, and really up until like the late 90s, early 2000s, you had what's called reset television. Every episode kind of uh, resolves itself by the end of the episode and resets so that you can jump into any show at any point and be perfectly fine and have a sound viewing experience 100% of the time. I'm not a fan of recent television, yet I love this because what Star Trek did and what Gene Roddenberry did was 
he brought in people who were gifted writers at telling one-hour morality plays. And the way those morality plays play out largely through Kirk and the Spock Bones uh, morality of logic versus passion and finding Kirk to figure out the through line between that has always captivated me. And I don't think any season of Star Trek, certainly the reset television seasons of Star Trek, has ever been better than the original season, season one of Star Trek, the original series. It has produced more consistently great episodes than any other series within the entire franchise up until some of the more recent ones. And we'll touch on those uh, in the future. That's a tease for what's to come. Um, but that original season is so good. There are great episodes where No Man Has Gone Before it is still one of my favorite episodes of uh, television, one of my favorite pieces of Star Trek media ever. That's the second pilot. The first pilot was called The Cage. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But the I just want to sort of hit you with some great episodes uh, or worthy notices of for the first season of Star Trek. You had Where No Man Has Gone Before, Charlie X, The Naked Time, which gets a really interesting callback that I think is interesting anyway, in The Next Generation. You have The Enemy Within, written by Richard Matheson. That episode lands a little bit campy, but the show was still kind of finding its footing, and if you watch 60s television, specifically mid-60s television, there's a lot of camp in it. So yeah, Shatner overacts a little bit, but it's kind of of the time, and Star Trek has moved beyond it. It's still a fun episode, well-written. Um, what Little Girls Are Made Of, a Nurse Chapel episode, who knew? Um, the Corbinite Maneuver, The Menagerie, Balance of Terror, which that along with Space Seed would kind of be the framework with which Wrath of Khan was hung. You have Shore Leave, which is a really fun episode. You have The Squire of Gothos, not a particularly great episode, but one that introduces the concept that would later get carried on to the next generation as Q. You have Arena, which is a masterful bit of storytelling. You have Space Seed, which is inarguably one of the best episodes of the original series of Star Trek. You have The Devil in the Dark, which matches Space Seed as being one of the best. Aaron of Mercy, not a particularly great episode, but introduces us to the Klingons, uh, just as Balance of Terror introduced us to the Romulans. And you have City on the Edge of Forever, widely considered the greatest piece of Star Trek television ever made. That's all just within season one. Now there aren't, there aren't all great episodes throughout. I think the original pilot uh, episode of the show, uh, so forgettable I can't even remember the name of it, is pretty weak sauce. And I say original pilot not in that it was shot to be a pilot, it was I think the seventh episode filmed, it was what debuted as the pilot. How anybody but he, how anybody continued watching is beyond me. But season one of Star Trek brought in tremendous writers. I mentioned Richard Matheson. You have uh, Harlan Ellison. You had Robert Block write an episode. Uh, he was the guy who wrote the novel Psycho, uh, which Hitchcock converted into the masterpiece that it is. You got great science fiction writers while also having great writers for television including D.C. Fontana. Now, J uh, Gene Roddenberry is known for Star Trek. He's the guy who created Star Trek. He's the guy that gets his name plastered everywhere within Star Trek. But not to be forgotten is D.C. Fontana. She shaped Star Trek in some of the most vital ways, most notably with shaping Spock. She's also written most of the great episodes of the, uh, not most, but a lot of great episodes of the original series, the animated series, and even a couple here and there for The Next Generation. She was a tremendous talent, and I think should be spoken in the same breath as Gene Roddenberry for shaping the show and shaping what Star Trek became. Season one is a masterpiece, and it's so exciting that that budget was uh, expanded for season two, and season two is glorious. However, season two of Star Trek is glorious to a point, and you can find the exact episode with which it kind of starts to sink. Well, season one 
was a hit with the character of Spock and to a lesser extent Kirk and became somewhat of a uh, touchstone of uh, television even while it aired, it was short-lived and by the middle of season two, Gene Roddenberry had to fight tooth and nail from getting his show cancelled. And you can see when the moment the perspective switches to from writing exceptional television to him having no control because he is trying to fight the powers that be in order to keep his show alive. Um, because it's with the Trouble with Tribbles episode, it is the last truly great episode of season two, everything afterwards isn't necessarily bad, it's just lesser. And it's uh, kind of unfortunate because season two hits the ground running. The first four episodes, I think, are four of the best episodes of Star Trek that ran in a consecutive order. You had Amok Time, which introduced you to the Vulcan uh, world for the first time. Some of those characters even lingering into the uh, next generation in some of the Star Trek movies. You had uh, Who Mourns for Adonis. Some people think it's a little uh, silly of an episode, and it kind of is, but it is incredibly watchable and very well written. You had The Changeling, a uh, episode of television that kind of was the framework for the first motion picture of Star Trek, proving once and for all that that story always should have just been 50 minutes. Um, Mirror Mirror, introducing us to the Mirror Dimension, which got carried through gloriously in Deep Space Nine. Um, you had the Doomsday Machine, which is one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek. You had Journey to Babel, which introduced us to Sarek, and uh, had like a good introduction to a lot of aliens that still linger on this show through to today. You had Wolf in the Fold, which is a fun little murder mystery episode. You had The Trouble with Tribbles. And, not to be forgotten, Metamorphosis, while not a great episode, Metamorphosis is fun because it introduces the character Zephram Cochran, who would go on to have a huge impact on one of the better Star Trek movies in First Contact, while also kind of shaping and guiding a lot of the trajectory of Enterprise. But alas, the second half of the season is kind of without any real strengths. They're, as I say, not necessarily bad episodes, it just becomes kind of blah episodes. And then that all culminates with what all TV shows, especially of the era, do when they're on their last legs. It tried to spin off with Assignment Earth. One of the worst episodes of Star Trek I think ever, um, that has sadly like carried on into the Star Trek lore recently with season two of Picard. Um, I'll let you discover those connections yourself uh, if you want to put yourself through that. But season two kind of ended with this thud. And I don't know how people kept watching season three, especially with the first episode of season three being Spock's Brain, which is considered by most, not me, most, to be the worst episode of the show. I do think uh, Assignment Earth is actually a worse episode. But Spock's Brain is pretty damn stupid. Um, season three really only had one genuinely good episode. And I, w I won't even say it's good, it's tremendous episode. The one episode that it had is Spectre of the Gun, where Kirk and crew are um, transported back into the Old West and have to uh, endure a battle uh, with Wyatt Earp. It's a great, great bit of storytelling, and I love that episode. It's one of my favorites. But shy of like the Enterprise incident and the Tholian web, which gets a neat callback in Enterprise, Season 3 is pretty weak sauce. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, Plato's Stepchildren. That episode had the infamous kiss between Kirk and Uhura. Um, and then uh, Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, which is an episode that uh, very plainly addresses racism uh, with an alien that has a black and white, but he has uh, people are being uh, prejudice towards him because he's black on the wrong side. Um, a lot of people write that episode off as being just really on the nose, but sometimes I think, especially with how uh, race relations and uh, not exclusive to race, but certain prejudices go, maybe being on the nose is okay. 
Um, so let that be your last battlefield. I'm not as down on it as some people are, but I do think it's an important episode and I needed to talk about. But just think, I named a ton of episodes from season one and two. Spectre of the Gun is the only one I can confidently tell you is a tremendous episode. I think Enterprise, Intruder, and Tholene Web are fine. Everything else is kind of weak sauce to bad, which is kind of shocking. And then the final episode, which could have been the last thing we ever had of Star Trek, was the Turnabout Intruder, which isn't necessarily a bad episode, but hell of bad messaging, uh, and is really incredibly sexist, uh, which I granted maybe of its time, but for Star Trek being such a forward-thinking show, that is an ass-backwards episode. Um, and it's disappointing. It was like he, uh, Roddenberry had his victory in that, yes, season three is alive, but the moment he had it, he didn't seem to have interest in it, and he kind of hopped off the ship, and you can see that that ship is, like, driving without a rudder. And not only that, the budget seems to be half of what the first season was. It looks cheap. Now, sometimes they successfully write in ways that that cheapness kind of works to the show's benefit. I think Spectre of the Gun does it very excellently, but a lot of times it doesn't. Um, Plato's Stepchildren is the most obnoxious bit of television I've ever seen. And it's disappointing, because what season one had was promise. Promise of greatness. And well, season two is very good, it didn't quite live up to that, and season three thuds with the best of them. Um, so it's kind of wild that this show had the staying power as it did, but I think the reason it did is because the characters, even in the bad episodes, are gripping. Shatner is perfect embodiment of that Kirk character, just as Leonard Nimoy is and will always be the icon that is Star Trek. You think Star Trek, you think Vulcan, you think Nimoy, you think Spock. I don't care if your Star Trek is Deep Space Nine or Voyager or Discovery. What you think of first is the iconography of Spock. Um, the hand, the ears, the eyebrow, logical. Uh, Spock is what you think of. DeForest Kelly uh, is perfect as uh, Bones being that passionate guy that could sound like a madman, but he plays it in such a balanced way, and an even way, and a likable way. You like that guy, even though he's a prejudiced mofo. You shouldn't probably like him sometimes, especially his interactions with Spock are kind of cringy. But he's so good that you kind of love him, uh, which is weird. Uh, you have Michelle, Nichol uh, Michelle Nichols uh, as Uhura, who is an unsung gem of that cast. She is so good, and she never really got the praise that she deserved for bringing that character to life, mostly because they didn't write much good material for her. Occasionally they did, and she has good moments. She has some pretty good stuff in Space Seed uh, and uh, Charlie X, Naked Time, stuff like that. But um, yeah, they, they, they underwrote her, just as they underwrote for, uh, George Takei as Sulu, who is fantastic, uh, and Walter Koenig, and, and, uh, as Chekhov in season two onwards, uh, he has some pretty good stuff, uh, in season three, honestly. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the cast is what really made this work, and I think the writing of some of those early episodes and the characters in the cast is what lingered on for this show to have such a spirited fan base that it got renewed once more in the form of a feature. Up next, I will be doing my list of the top ten episodes of Star Trek, the original series, and then after that, I'm going to move on to the animated series and then do a micro re-review of Star Trek The Motion Picture. So over the next couple of weeks, you'll have those to look forward to. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe. Let me know what your favorite season of the original series is. Is it one, two, or three? I have a feeling it's either going to be one or two. If you like season three, 
drop down in the comments. What is it, man? What is it that you like about season three? Um, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Peace.